All right, so we're going to jump in here to, uh, this is again, this is the third message in Renewing the Mind. It's still under the category of indwelling life. And like I mentioned, we're just going to, we're going to stay on Renewing the Mind for as long as the Holy Spirit is, I, I've really felt the Holy Spirit to, to pause here and stay on Renewing the Mind. And we're going to talk today about the link between the law of the mind and the law of faith. There's a very uh deep connection that was going to be explained here between how you think and how you believe in your heart. They're intricately connected. And so to truly renew your mind, your heart also must align with the truth of God's word. So the truth, whatever we believe in our heart ultimately bubbles up into our thinking. And if we're wondering, okay, I, I keep thinking these thoughts and can't seem to turn off these thoughts Normally, or a lot of times, what's happening is there is a belief in our heart, deeply rooted, we aren't even aware of, that that heart belief is forming our thinking patterns in our mind. So we're going to talk about the link today between renewing the mind and, and faith. And so it's very, faith is very, very important, and we're going to talk about that in this uh, teaching, in this session today. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter, eight, verse, or Luke, Luke chapter 18, verse 8. And Jesus asked a question that is very important for us to ask or for us to also look at and say, okay, Lord, what is it you're trying to speak? Because he's speaking and he's talking about the end of the age, which is clearly the day and age which we live. And the Lord asked the question, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, I want you to know that Jesus Christ, the all-knowing, omniscient God, does not ask questions because he's seeking information. He's not like, oh, I don't know the answer to this, so therefore I'm going to ask, will he find faith on the earth? He's saying he won't find faith on the earth in many people. But the question we want to ask ourselves is, will he find faith in us? That's the question. It's a sobering question, actually, to think that Jesus is actually prophesying what it would be like at the end of the age, and that there would be a crisis of faith in the earth that would take place. And I want to submit to you, we're living in that time right now. We're not fully into that time, but we're living in that time right now. We are living in that crisis of faith. Paul said before the Lord returns, there would be a great falling away from the faith, the great apostasy. I believe that great apostasy is not yet fully here, but it is definitely beginning. It's at its very beginnings, and we're seeing Christians begin to apostatize. It's heartbreaking. It's sad. So the question is, will he find faith on the earth? The question is, will he find faith in my heart? And there's a connection between renewing the mind and faith. There's a connection between faith and living by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. So we want to look at those things. And so when the Lord was asking that question in Luke 18, you can look at the context and you can see one of the reasons why there will be a crisis of faith at the end of the age is because of injustice. You can read the context there and see the Lord's going to bring about justice speedily, but when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? There, injustice, the, the amount of injustice that's going to happen at the end of the age is going to be like nothing we've ever seen before in human history on a global scale. And as a result of the injustice, the gross injustice that's driven by the love of money and the love of power and the love of control by those who have money and control and power, that the injustice they will put onto the inhabitants of the earth is going to be so intense it's going to cause many to lose their faith. The question is for us, will that be me? Will that be you? God help us know. Let, God help us. Let us present to the Lord a heart of faith that has been tried by fire. And we have overcome the world. That's what John said. This is how we overcome the world, by your faith. See, you cannot live on the faith of your pastor or your elders. You cannot live on the faith of your parents. You cannot live on the faith of your spouse. You cannot live on the faith of your grandparents. You cannot live on the faith of your friends or your favorite person on YouTube. You've got to have your own faith. And in fact, your faith 
is one of the most important things about you. Far more important than how much money you have in your bank account. Far more important than how much influence you have or how much success you have in this world. Your faith is one of the most important things about you. And we want to make sure that we're growing in faith. See, we, you, you never stay stagnant. You are either progressing in faith or you are regressing in faith. You never stay stagnant. You never stay stationary. You're either moving onward into greater and greater and greater measures of faith or you're degressing into lesser and lesser and lesser degrees of faith. And that's why, James, that's why Hebrews says, speaking to Christians, that's why Hebrews says, take care, brethren. He's speaking to believers. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief that falls away from the living God. It can happen to Christians. It can happen to Christians. James was saying to, in the book of James chapter 2, he's saying that if you say you have faith, but you don't have works, your faith is dead. It's useless. Faith without works is dead. Now, that doesn't mean you go off and try to prove your faith by your works. It means that you get faith, and if you get faith, you will do the works that he's called you to do, the works of obedience. So, there is, a, there, is a, there is a crisis coming in the earth. We just came out of this pandemic. We're about a year and a half since this, this pandemic really at its, at its peak. And, you know, I just have this sensing there is another birth pain coming. There's another birth pain coming. Do I want that? No, I don't want that. But my, my, my heart is to say to us, don't become complacent right now. Now is the time to press in like never before. We've got to put our roots down deeply. It was a person in the parable of the sower who did not have a firm root in themselves. That one that did not have their faith rooted deeply inside of them by the planting of God's word, it was that person that when pressure came, when persecution came, when trials came, because of the word of God, they believed for a little while and fell away. You hear what I'm saying? The warning to us. We've never experienced persecution in America. I hope we don't have to experience persecution in America. Some people are like, yeah, bring it on. I'm like reading, you know, Angie's reading some of these, the, the persecution that happened under communism through different men of God, women of God, that, that, that what they experience, I mean, it's not pleasant. It's cha I mean, God was in it, but it's, a ch it's challenging. We've never experienced persecution here in America. I don't know how I would respond. How, I mean, how would you respond? We don't know how we would respond in the testing of our faith. My heart is, let's right now go deep so that when the testing does come, we don't fall away. We don't fall into unbelief when the testing comes. Amen. So the message is going to get more positive than this. This is just kind of an intense introduction. But your faith is greater than your wealth. That's what, that's what Scripture teaches. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Peter makes a, a message or makes a statement. I love 1 Peter 1, 5 through 9. We're going to unpack this. We're going to go through this. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 5 through 9, he says, Who are protected by the power of God. God is the one who's protecting you by his power through your faith. For a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What an incredible statement. We have no idea how incredible our salvation really is. We only have a very small deposit, but when that salvation comes to fullness, justification moves to sanctification, moves to glorification, and God's sons come back that all creation is groaning for and longing for, God, Peter's saying, when that salvation is revealed in the end of the age, it is going to be absolutely incredible. We are living in an awesome time. 
An incredible time. What an incredible time to be alive. Yes, there's great pressure. There's also great glory. In this you greatly rejoice, even now for a little while, if necessary. Some trials are necessary. Some are not. Some trials are necessary. Some trials are not. I'll come back to that in a second. You have been distressed by various trials, knowing that the proof or the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And, you do not, and though you do not see him now, but you believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. The salvation of your soul is tied to your faith. Now, let me just break apart just a little bit of this, this statement here as we talk about faith, the genuineness of your faith. See, the fire proves our faith. The fire proves if our faith is genuine. The fire proves if our faith is false. It's just mental agreement, mental assent. Is it, is it really genuine faith that we have? The fire itself does the testing. Now, this word genuine comes from the Greek word dokimos. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that right, dokimos. Now, dokimos, what, what happened in the ancient world is, is they would take, they didn't have money like we have money today. Uh, and they definitely didn't have digital currency they didn't have computers or any of that back then, but they just basically had gold. They, put, they poured gold into this mold, and that mold would form, and they would take, you know, they would pull the, gold, the coins out, and they would begin to scrape off the edges. And so what people began to do is they, is they began to scrape off more and more of the edges to pocket that spare gold. And what was happening is they, in, in, in one century, there was more than 80 different laws in Athens, Greece, that said in terms related to this, this uh, people uh, cutting off more and more of the gold, but there was, there was certain people called the dokimos, and these were known as the genuine people who would only receive the, the currency that was derived, that, was, that, was, that fit the mold as prescribed by the law. In other words, if they noticed that this currency had been altered or this currency had been scraped away, they would not take that money, and they were known as the dokimos. And that's really what, this, what Peter's saying here is that your faith would be proven as genuine. Your faith would be proven as genuine. Your, your faith would be proven that it's real. It's not mental assent. It's not the, like the demons, like James said. It's not those who believe in God and, and they shudder. It's not mental assent. It's not just we mentally agree that Jesus Christ is Lord. No, faith is proven by its works. Faith is proven in the test. Faith is proving by the fire. And so that's what, Paul, that's what uh, Peter is getting at is the genuineness of your faith. It's more precious than gold. It's more precious than billions of dollars in your bank account. Your faith is one of the most important things about you is your faith. Is your faith progressing or is your faith regressing? Because your faith never stays stagnant. You're either progressing or you are regressing. You're either, either, either moving forward or you're falling away. What is your faith like? Because the fire that's coming into this earth is going to test my faith and your faith, our faith. Is our faith genuine and fire tested? Okay, a little intense, but it's true. 1 John 5, 4 says, Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. When you're born of God, your faith overcomes the world. Your faith at the end of the age is going to be what makes you one who overcomes. 
Your faith, though tested by fire, is going to be what gives you the power to overcome whatever circumstance, trial, situation you find yourself going through. Now, remember Peter said, some trials are necessary. See, when you're going through trials, you've got to discern whether the, whether the trial you are going through is inspired by an attack of the devil or if the trial you're going through is allowed by God for the refinement of your character to help you to live more and more by grace. If the trial you're going through is inspired by the devil, then you must take authority over it. You must stand against the devil and rebuke him. You must take authority over him and resist the devil. See, a lot of times Christians in, in this warped view of God's sovereignty have all these attacks that come in against them and they go, God's just allowing this. God's just permitting this. And the God's like, I'm not permitting anything. You need to take authority. You need to get up off the couch and exercise your authority as a believer and declare the word of God into your circumstances and rebuke the devil. And he will flee. So you need to discern, is this attack coming from the devil? Or you need to discern, is this trial coming from my own bad choices and stupidity. <laughs> we've all made them, haven't we? We've all done that. We've all made bad choices. We've all made things that we sowed 10, 15, 20 years ago. We're now reaping. And when, if, if those situations that we're in right now are because of our bad decisions, because of sowing to the flesh, and we're now reaping the consequences of that, the only way to overcome that is to begin to live from this day forward by the Spirit of God. Now, if we're going through a trial and is God is permitting it, like Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and and you know God's he's like he's like praying out to God, Lord, deliver me from this thorn in the flesh, deliver me from this oppression of the enemy. And there's a big debate about what the thorn in the flesh is. I tend to think this thorn in the flesh was re, a religious persecution that was coming against Paul, and, and Paul's saying, God, deliver me from this thorn in the flesh, and the Lord said basically told Paul, no. In this situation, I'm not going to deliver you right now because I, Paul, want to teach you how to live by grace. That when you are weak, Paul, then you are strong. That, Paul, when you are at the end of yourself in affliction or distress or persecution or whatever it is, when you're at the end of yourself, then and that's when you are strong. Paul, God was trying to teach Paul how to live by the grace of God, how to get out of self-reliance into spirit reliance. And Jesus said, no, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is perfected in your weakness. So back to this, if you find that the trial you're going through is necessary, then the best thing is to say, God, let my faith be purified. Let my faith be refined like gold is refined by fire. And Peter said that your faith is more precious. Your faith is more valuable. I want, you to, I want this to sink in. A lot of times we look on our bank account and we go, Okay, this is what's valuable. And we give our lives to working and striving to make more and more money. And we're always fixed on, okay, how can we grow our bank account? How can we grow our wealth? And, you know, we're so focused on getting bigger and better things. And God's like, no, you're the most important. I'm not, and again, I'm not against money. But the Lord's like, the most important thing about you is not what's in your bank account. It's not how much influence that you have. It is your faith. Is your faith becoming more and more fire-tested? Is your faith becoming more and more genuine? Is your faith becoming more and more proven? Is your faith overcoming the world? Is your faith, that shield of faith we have in our spiritual armor, resisting the fiery darts of the evil one? Is your faith growing and increasing? See, is your faith are you, are you moving forward in your faith or are you regressing? Are you shrinking back to destruction or are you moving forward no matter the cost? Your faith is one of the most important things about you, more precious than gold. More precious than gold. And he says here that, that this may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What he means by that is when you see the Lord on that day 
and you've gone through the fire and your faith has overcome the world, Jesus himself, this, now think about this, Jesus himself is going to look at you and he's going to praise you. He's going to give you glory and he's going to give you honor. I didn't know, Lord, that you were looking at my faith this way. He looks at you and he says, Beloved, you went through the trial and you didn't quit. You went through the trial and you didn't stop. You went through the testing and you didn't fall away. You overcame your situation because you trusted in me. I praise you. I honor you. I glory, it even says praise, honor, and glory. I, I even praise you. I, I give you glory even for overcoming in the midst of your circumstance, in the midst of your trial, you did not quit. You did not renounce God. Even when the devil was lying into your ear and he was saying, if God was good, why would he have allowed this? If God was really good, why would he have allowed you to go through this circumstance, through this trial, through this situation? And the Lord says on that day, you did not quit. You did not believe the lie of the enemy, and he gives you praise and glory when he is revealed. Your faith is the most important thing or one of the most important things about you. Now, let's look at Hebrews 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6, one of the most quoted faith scriptures, but it's really, really powerful, powerful scripture. And without faith... It is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. I want you to catch that. If you want to please God, it does not say, and without kindness, we can't please him. It doesn't say without love, you can't please him. It doesn't say... Without being nice, you can't please him. It says, without faith, you can't please him. It takes faith to please God. God moves by faith. Now, I just want to just read this slightly different in the context of indwelling life and, and read it this way. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and my brackets are, in you. See, when you come to God in prayer, when you come to God in worship... You must believe that he's in you. Okay, yeah, there's a place to look up, but God wants you also to look in. You're not looking in to yourself. You're looking in to where Christ now dwells in the holy of holies of the new temple. You're looking in to where now Christ, who is the hope of glory, now dwells. You have the very spirit of the Lord who raised Jesus from the dead dwelling inside of you. You have the one who spoke Genesis 1 and 2 into, into existence. He spoke the universe into existence. That one now lives inside of you. And so when you come to God, you're coming with faith that he is in you. See, if you come to God and you're just going, Lord, I hope you hear me. Hello up there somewhere. Hopefully you can hear me. God's like, I can hear you loud and clear. I don't have ear, AirPods in my ears like your daughter does when you're trying to talk to her. Hey, can I take out the trash. And she's just dancing and singing even like Larry was earlier. I was like, Larry, you sound like, look at my daughter with her AirPods in her ears. Can't even hear what I'm saying. God doesn't have AirPods in his ears like screaming up, God, I hope you can hear me. God's in you. Christ is in you. And what, what faith does is faith believes that God is not just up there in heaven in a throne. That he is. But faith, when, he come, when, you, when faith comes to God, faith comes to God and he comes to God in you. You can have instant connection with God. You can have instant fellowship with God because he's not just up there in the Holy of Holies of Heaven's temple. He's in the Holy of Holies of your temple right here in you. Any moment, any day, any time, you can turn inward to him and you can fellowship with him and you can hear him and you can know him because he's in you. How do you do it? By faith. Believe. 
You're not believing something that's not real. You're believing what's real because the Word says it's real. It's not trying to brainwash you into believing something that's not real. No, it's real. The Word says it very clearly. Christ is in you. And coming to the Lord is coming to Him in you. And when you come to the Lord in you, that's faith. And when that faith is moving and that faith is an operation, that faith pleases God. You can't please God without faith. Now, what we're going to do in this session and in, in next teaching is we're going to make the connection between the mind and the heart. There is a heart-mind connection that we want to look at. And we'll look at this probably in the next teaching on this is faith... Belief is a matter of the heart. Romans chapter 10, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Belief is in the heart. Faith is in the heart. It's in the heart where unbelief is. It's in the heart where doubt is. It's in the heart where faith is. And so faith being a matter of the heart influences the mind. There is a heart and mind connection. If you feel as if, okay, I'm thinking a certain way. Let's just pick one that we probably all struggle with, anxiety. I'm, I'm anxious about this situation. I'm anxious about whether I'm going to have enough money to pay the bills. I'm anxious about whether or not this situation is going to break through on my behalf. I'm anxious or not about if I'm going to have the breakthrough that I desperately, desperately need. I'm, I'm worrying. I'm anxious. I'm filled with anxiety about this issue. And these thoughts keep bombarding my mind. And what really is happening, we can't seem to turn these anxious thoughts off. What really is going on in the heart is a battle in our heart of whether we believe the truth that God is our provider or we believe the lie that we must take care of ourselves. What's really going on that's affecting the mind, that's causing us to be in an emotional frenzy, what's really going on is what's not here even in the mind. What's really going on is what's in the heart. And to get victory over the mind, we've got to get victory with what's in our heart. To get victory with how we live and our thinking, we've got to get victory in how we believe, whether we're believing a lie or believing the truth. See, we can never rise above our present circumstances or situations if we don't first correct false beliefs in our heart. Are we believing the truth or are we believing the lie? Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. See, a lot of us, our lives, our thinking, our actions are a mess because we have been believing lies of the devil for years, decades. We believe in lies. You're unworthy. No one will ever like you. God's mad at you. You're a failure. You're a hopeless hypocrite. You will never change. You will never be transformed. You are a rejection. You are a hopeless hypocrite who has no hope. I guess if you're hopeless, you have no hope. Who has, will never get the breakthrough you're looking for. God's mad at you. God doesn't like you. They don't like you. No one likes you. You're a rejection, et cetera, et cetera. And God says, no, that's not true. That's the lie of the devil you have been believing. The truth is God says, you are my beloved. God says, my thoughts about you are more than the sand of the sea. God says, even before you, you were born, I thought about you, and I planned your biography before the foundation of the world. I wrote out your script before you were even born. I think about you more than you could ever realize and fathom. I have inscribed you on the palm of my hand. You are my beloved disciple. Just like John said, I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. God says, you are the disciple whom he loves. That even if it was just one person alive, Jesus would have died for you. That is God's love for you. You're not a hopeless hypocrite. You have not been rejected by God. You are not unworthy. You are not rooted in rejection. You are, you are deeply loved by God. God's love flowing into your heart. Like Ephesians 3, the, the love of God that surpasses knowledge. You can't even comprehend the fact that God loves you. God loves to be with you. God loves to have conversations with you. God loves when you and him are alone and he says to you, you are my beloved. You are this one I love. 
Renew your mind in that. Change what you believe in your heart about yourself, what you believe about God in your heart, what you believe, who he is and what he's going to do, what you believe about yourself and your situation and your circumstances. What you believe in your heart, whatever you believe in your heart, is like you're on autopilot. It's just like autopilot in a plane or autopilot in an electric car. You plug it in, a, just take the Tesla, you plug in the address, put it into Google Maps, and you say, take me to this address. Well, your electric car on autopilot is going to go exactly to that address. No matter what you do, that destination is where it's going to lead you. It's on autopilot. And if we have certain, whatever beliefs we have in our heart, no matter how much we try to change the circumstances, whatever beliefs we have in our heart is going to put us onto autopilot to get to that exact destination that has already been programmed. And the way we need to change our destiny and change our thoughts and change our character and change where we are going is to pre-pro reprogram our mind with new beliefs that will change the way we think and the way we believe. Does that make sense? You will be on autopilot based on what you believe, no matter how hard you try to change it. What you believe will ultimately drive you to where you're going. There is a heart and a mind connection. Faith is an issue of the heart. Thinking, rationalizing is in the mind, and they're connected. And I want to show you the connection here in Scripture. Proverbs 4.23, Solomon said to watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Everything in your life is the byproduct of your heart, what you believe. Everything you're seeing in your life is based on the fruit of of your beliefs in your heart. If you want to change the way you live, if you want to change your life, if you want to live by the indwelling life of Christ, change the way you believe. Don't try to work harder. Believe better. Believe that Jesus Christ is in you. Believe the one who is in you, that the one who is in you is the one who raised the, raises the dead. Believe that he is the one. He is the helper. You have access to the mind of Christ. Believe that he has transformed your spirit. Believe who you are in Jesus Christ. Believe those things. Reprogram your mind, and it will change the way you live, change the way you think. Now, let's turn to Mark chapter 7, verse 21. I want you to see this again. Mark 7, 21 Jesus said, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts. Now, I just want to pause there for one second. Evil thoughts, and I would also say, he, he's focused on the negative here, but I would also say good thoughts, or just thoughts, evil or good, come from the heart. You see that? Your heart is the source of your thinking. Now, again, there's seven different places of, of your thoughts. I mentioned that in an earlier session. But your heart is one, of the, is one of the keys. It's one of the keys. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, fornication, theft, murder, adulteries, uh, deeds of coveting, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things proceed from within and defile the man. So really what the Lord is showing us here is that renewing the mind is essential because, you know, we just spent two sessions talking about renewing the mind. But I've also discovered that if I can't turn off my thoughts, no matter how much I want to, if these thoughts cannot be turned off, I realize, okay, there's something deeper going on in my heart. And i got to find out, okay, it's like a check engine light on your car. i got to find out what's wrong with the engine of my heart. What lies am I believing? What lies am I believing that's causing and creating these negative mindsets and emotions and circumstances in my life? What 
neg- what lies have I bought into? What flaming darts of the evil one have, have landed within my heart and created a belief in the lies, a belief in, in lies that are not based on truth, that are not God's word, based on God's word? What lies am I, am I believing and I would encourage you, we, we're talk, we had a forerunner school call on Thursday, and I said, I challenge everyone, and I need to do it myself, is take some time in prayer and just ask the Lord, Lord, show me what lies I am believing. And I've done that in the past, and it's amazing what God shows you. You're like, I had no idea. I had no idea. I was deep, deep down in my heart, I was believing this set of lies and those set of lies were put me on autopilot and I was going in the very direction of my heart beliefs. And I had to take out those those lies and I had to confront them with the truth. Whatever, Whatever lies that come up and God reveals to you, you must confront it with the truth of God's word. If you're struggling with anxiety and you feel like you have to be the provider or you have to be the one in control, confront that with the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, take no thought for your life because your Father is your provider. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added to you. God is your provider, not you. What lies are you believing? That, doesn't, no, that does not mean you don't have to work. Okay, don't, don't go off on the deep end. I'm saying God is your provider. Well, I need the tithe. No, I'm kidding about that. But um, your, your mind is flowing from what is in your heart. Now let's turn to, or let's not even turn to, I just want to quote Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 17. And we've quoted this a lot when we're talking about the, the, the spirit being strong. Is at the end of that, we saw that your spirit must be strong so that, it's conditional, so that, Christ may dwell in your heart, how? By faith. See, even though Jesus Christ is one spirit with your spirit, if you are in a state of doubt and unbelief, if you are in a state of, you're not in a state of faith, then the spirit of the Lord is suppressed within you. He cannot fill you. He cannot dwell in your heart. He cannot permeate your heart and tabernacle in your heart unless your heart is believing the truth. Faith is how the Spirit of the Lord is released from within you. Paul was talking in Romans 1.17. He says, the righteous man will live by faith from first to last. Everything in the Christian life, every single thing in the Christian life is by faith. You are saved by faith. You are justified by faith. You're born again by faith. You're sanctified by faith. It's by grace through faith, by grace through faith, by grace through faith. Everything in the Christian life is by grace through faith. Grace being the power of God that sanctifies you, the power of God that justifies you. Grace being the enablement of God that works not based upon merit, but based upon the power of God, not by achieving, but through receiving. God's grace enables you to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. God's grace enables you to be who God's called you to be and to do what God's called you to do. But God's grace will not operate if you don't have faith. Faith is the password to get onto your iPhone. Faith is the password to get onto your computer. Faith is the key that unlocks the door to God's grace. If you don't lack, if you, if you lack faith, you lack the password. You lack the key, and therefore, this, this, all this treasure of God's grace that would transform you and bring change is locked up because unbelief and doubt hinder the release of God's grace. But once faith springs up, and once you remember, we talked about Philemon one six. Once you activate. Your faith, your faith becomes energized, activated by thinking on and acknowledging the good things that are in you. Once that takes place, then your faith is energized and the grace of God, which is power, begins to flow from your spirit into your heart that enables you to be who God's called you to be. You with me? Faith activates grace. God will not move on our behalf if we don't have faith. 
Jesus did not do many miracles because of their unbelief. The children of, of Israel, they died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. Even though Christ is in you, if, you're, if you don't believe it, if you are, are filled with doubt and unbelief about that, and you just have mental ascent and don't have revelation, don't have faith, Christ being that treasure in you will stay dormant and suppressed unless it's, he's released by faith. Now let's turn to Ephesians 1, verse 3. Paul said, Blessed be, the God of our Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Where are the blessings? They're in heaven. Who are the blessings in? They are in Christ. What kind of blessings are they? They're spiritual blessings. To get the blessings in heaven that are in Christ operative in your life on earth that are spiritual, Christ in heaven must transmit that the power of God from him to the indwelling spirit to your human spirit because these are received by, by, the, these are received by the spirit. You cannot receive spiritual blessings in the soul. You receive spiritual blessings in the spirit. You cannot receive spiritual blessings in your mind, your will, and your emotions, and in your body. Now, obviously, you can receive healing in your body and stuff like that, but they, what I'm getting at is, is, is the blessings that are in Christ of living by his life. These come, these are transmitted in heaven in Christ to you through the indwelling spirit who's now connected to your human spirit that those those. Those blessings are transmitted to your spirit, which then flow upward and outward out of you, out of your heart, out of your mind, out of your soul. That makes sense? Faith is how those blessings are substantiated. Faith is how those blessings become real. Those blessings are yours in Christ. What are these blessings? I'll just go over just a couple of them, just a few of them. Your death to sin, to self, and to the law, all those blessings are in Christ, belong to you. You have died to the, to the self. You have died to the law. You have died to sin. All those blessings are yours in Jesus Christ. They belong to you. They're spiritual blessings. They belong to you, but faith is the only way for that, those blessings to be activated. If you don't, you know, Paul said, reckon yourselves alive to God and dead to sin. If you don't reckon yourself, if you don't come into agreement with it and, and your faith is activated, those blessings that are in Christ will not be in your experience. God wants to make your legal position in Christ, your living condition in Christ by the Spirit through experience. It's by faith that these come into your life. Faith is the key to receiving the Spirit's transmission of grace to your spirit, enabling you to receive these spiritual blessings. It takes faith. If you're not living in the blessings of God, if you're not living and walking in who you are in Christ, who Christ is in you, then the problem probably lies in the fact you don't believe. There's a crisis of faith. What does God's Word say? And what are you believing? Faith is the password that gives access to the grace of God. Faith is the key that unlocks the door. Faith is the conduit through which the grace of God flows. Faith is by grace through faith. You began your walk in Jesus Christ by grace through faith, and every step of the walk is also by grace through faith. See, there is a law of faith just like there is a law of the mind that if your mind is set on the things of the flesh, you're going to live in the flesh. Always you're going to live in the flesh. It doesn't matter how nice you are, how kind you are, how good you are. It doesn't matter how many good things you did, how many people you blessed. If your mind is set on the flesh every single time because it is a law, you will live in the flesh. If, you're, if your mind is set on the spirit... Every single time your mind is set on the spirit, you will live in the spirit. Whatever your mind is set on, flesh or spirit, is going to be the state you live in, flesh or spirit. 
It's a, it's a law that cannot be violated, the law of the mind. There's also the law of faith. The law of faith, I believe just to say the law of faith, God does nothing except by faith. If you don't believe, God's not going to move on your life. If you believe, God is going to move in your life. If you don't believe that he will live his life through you, then he's not going to live his life through you. If you believe God is going to live his life through you, God will live his life through you. See, the law of faith, the law of faith cannot be violated. No matter how good of a person you are, no matter how nice you are, no matter how good your intentions are, the law of the faith and the law of the mind go together. Renewing the mind activates faith. Renewing the mind shapes your heart to believe the truth and not the lie. When your mind is renewed and your heart has been reshaped to believe the truth, what happens is faith is activated, and when faith is activated, God moves. It's a law of faith. It cannot be violated. Let's look at Romans 3, verse 27. Where then is boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. By a law of faith. You see, the law of faith cannot be violated. We must believe God is. We must believe God's in us. We must believe what he's done, what the word says he's done. And as we believe what, who he is and we believe what he's done, then that faith opens a door to access the grace of God. And the grace of God is how you are transformed into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. But if you're living in doubt and living in unbelief, that grace available to you will not be accessed. It'll be a closed door to you until you go in and unlock that door and go in and get the grace of God needed for change. So faith draws the life of the Spirit of God out of you. So now that it's Christ in you living rather than you. Faith is how you, you access that river of life and release it. Faith is renewing the mind. Or re renewing the mind activates faith. Let's look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 2. Paul was, was talking to the Galatians, and he was, he was absolutely, you, you can tell he's really frustrated. Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. And Paul was saying, this is, you know, you can just feel his outrage with the Galatians. He spent all this time laying a foundation, and they've, he delivered them from the law and to Christ. And all this effort he's done, and they have gone back under the law. And he's coming to them and he's rebuking them. And he says, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? And he goes, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected or sanctified by the flesh? Going down a little bit, he says, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? The, quite, the answer is by hearing with faith. The entire Christian life is by hearing with faith. God moves in the hearing with faith. If you want to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, it's not by the works of the law. It's not by your own self-effort. It's not by you gritting your teeth and trying in your own effort for him to rise up and live through you. No, it's hearing with faith. Well, how does hearing come? It comes by speaking. Well, how does, what is speaking? It is meditation. So what we talked about last Sunday is meditation must be activated by your mouth. Meditation must be activated by what you write, by what you sing. Meditation is not just thinking deeply. Meditation is not just reading. Meditation is not just studying. All those are good. All those are necessary. Meditation must be voiced. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. I'll tell you the truth. 
If you feel spiritually dead and unenergized spiritually, if you want that coffee, that latte that you need, spiritually speaking, begin to speak out the Word of God. I'm telling you, you can feel, uh, you can feel so dead spiritually. But if you will begin to declare the Word of the Lord, that you will begin to acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Jesus Christ, and you will begin to activate that faith, energize that faith. If you feel as if, spiritually speaking, you don't have spiritual energy, which that word means, that we get the word um, in Philemon 1.6, that your faith would be energized or activated. We get the English word energy from that, that faith is like an energy. If you feel spiritually lethargic, it's probably because your faith is not activated. Get your faith activated, it'll give you energy. I, it even gives you physical energy. It'll get, when, you, when your faith is alive and active, and your faith is, is moving and in alignment with the truth of God's Word, you will actually have physical energy, not just spiritual energy. The Christian life from beginning to end is by hearing with faith, not by works, not by self-effort, not by self-discipline. So the law of faith is this. You will ultimately think and act upon what you believe in your heart. And this will establish your character and your destiny. Say that again. You will ultimately think and act upon what you believe in your heart. And this will establish your character and your destiny. It is autopilot. And the reason it's this way is because God's designed it that way. It's the law of faith. This law works for believers and unbelievers because God designed the human heart to operate by faith. Because he wanted a certain kind of life with his creature, with his, with his creation, humans. So the unbeliever lives by the law of faith. They don't know it, but what they believe is how they ultimately live. You know, you think about like a football team, and if a football team doesn't believe they can win the championship, they can't. But, you know, you've seen, or you can take a basketball team that gets in the Sweet, the, uh, sweet 16 or the, or the March Madness, and all of a sudden they were the Cinderella team, and all of a sudden... A little bit of belief gets in their heart. And they believe that they can, and they can. I'm not talking, this is just not, I'm not trying to get to sound new agey. I'm saying God's designed this. God's designed the law of faith in the human heart. Paul mentioned it in Romans chapter 3. The law of faith in the human heart cannot be violated. You will never rise above what you believe. If you believe it, you can do it. Now, I know that is a kind of a, you know, taught in self-help psychology, but it's a biblical principle that the law of faith, what you believe is how you're going to think. How you're going to think is going to determine what actions you take. What actions you take is going to determine the kind of person you become, and the kind of person you become determines your destiny, both in this life and forever. So it's very important that our thinking, our beliefs, are in alignment with the truth of God's word and not with the lies of the enemy, not with the lies of culture, not with what culture is pushing down our throats as their values. God's word is unchanging. God's word will never change. God's word doesn't need to be relevant. God's word doesn't need to progress. God got it right the first time. It doesn't need changing. It's, it's perfect. And his word, though the grass may fade and the earth passes away, God's word is never, ever going to pass away. Build your life on the word of God. Exchange the, the lie for the truth and align your heart with what God's word says is true. Don't believe the lie. You'll never get beyond this law. Now, I'll close with this little Last segment. Let's, let's, um, 
Habakkuk 2, verse 4. Habakkuk 2, verse 4. Paul quoted this in Romans 1, 17. But as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. But the righteous one, the righteous, will live by his faith. So often we think the opposite of faith is fear, or the opposite of faith is doubt and unbelief. And yes, that's true. But Habakkuk tells us there's actually something even deeper to the opposite of faith, and that's pride. Look what he said. Behold us for the proud one. His soul is not right within him. In other words, Habakkuk, by the Spirit of God, is telling us the righteous one is going to live by faith. The proud one lives by his own self-life. The proud one lives by his own opinions, his own rationalizations, his own emotions, his own preferences, his, what he wants, when he wants it, how he wants it. The proud one lives by the self-life. The righteous one lives by the life of Christ. See, if we want to live by faith, what has to happen is the self-life who wants to always try to figure it out, the self-life who is guided by its emotions, the self-life who is guided by self-preference, what I want, how I want it, when I want it done, that self-life has to meet the work of the cross. And that work of the cross, as pride is put down, as pride is crucified, as self-reliance, independence, rebellion, self-effort, as that meets the cross of Jesus Christ applied by the Spirit of God, then faith begins to be activated, which is not a self-reliance, but a spirit reliance that we're relying moment by moment, leaning like it says in the, in the Song of Solomon. Who is this that comes out of the wilderness leaning on her beloved? That's the posture of the bride who's made herself ready. If she's not living of her own strength and her own self-effort. She's leaning on the beloved, living by faith and not by her own strength. So as we wrap this up, the importance of faith. We'll, we'll, we'll look at four principles of faith in the next session. But the importance of living by faith. You will never go beyond what you believe in your heart. Here's what I want to, I just want to end this with just challenging you to do what I challenge our forerunner school call, forerunner school students and people on that call to do was to really get before the Lord and ask him, Lord, with a notebook ready to write down what he says, Lord, show me and speak to me what heart beliefs, what lies I'm believing. Lord, show me what lies I'm believing. What lies Am I presently believing right now that is hindering me from going forward in you? Lord, what lies am I believing? Show me, speak to me. And as he does, you'll probably write up a, a notebook, two, three, four pages, maybe one. Who knows? It depends on the condition. You know, you might just write two or three, you know, but just begin writing down, okay, Lord, I'm waiting on you to reveal to me what lies I'm believing. That's, that's homework. That, that's point A. Point A is, okay, show me, Lord, what lies I'm believing. Point B would be, okay, Lord, I need to find in your word the exact truth that counters the lies I'm believing. If you're struggling with anxiety, you need to focus on uh, promises that talk about God being your provider, God being the one who takes care of you, God being the one who will bring breakthrough, God who being the one who will secure you and protect you. If you struggle with rejection or unworthiness, then you would want to look at scriptures that talk about God's love for you, God's care for how much he cares about you and thinks about you, that you are his beloved. You see what I'm saying? And that, that's point B. And then point C would be begin to turn those into prayers where you say, Lord, you know, I renounce this lie that says I've got to provide for myself. I renounce this lie. I break agreement where the enemy has come in and put these lies into me, and I've agreed with that lie. I've, I've given my agreement to it. See, a lot of times faith is agreement. Faith is agreeing with either the lie or the truth. I have agreed with this lie, 
Even I didn't even realize I did it, but I agree with this lie and I'm on autopilot. Now I'm agreeing with the truth that you are the provider. You are the one who loves me. You say I am your beloved. You know, the list could go on. So do those three things. Write down, Lord, what lies am I believing? Write down the truth that counters those lies. And then number three is, is begin to, to develop a prayer that you can begin to pray that will, that, you know, and whether you write it or speak it, I just want to encourage you to speak it or write it because it, it, it can't just be thought, that will counter those, those heart beliefs. And as you do that, if you begin to change your beliefs, what you believe in your heart, your mind will begin to change, your emotions will begin to change, your will will begin to change, the life of Christ will begin to flow out of you. The grace of God that comes by faith will begin to move. The grace of God that changes you will begin to work and you will be transformed into an entirely new person. The, the, the work he's done in your spirit will be released into your heart, mind, soul, and, soul, and thinking and emotions and your body and the life of God in you will flow out so that you become that shining light in a dark world. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, God, for what you are doing. Thank you, Lord, for faith. Thank you for the way you designed the human heart. And Lord, I just want to pray for everyone, all of us, me included, would you give us, as we seek you in this homework assignment, would you give us, Lord, the revelation of those lies that we are believing that counteract your truth, that contradict your truth, so we may come into alignment with the word of God. Lord, I pray for that in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we'll